I recently made a video about how I designed and built my CNC router. The video ended up generating a lot of interest and many people had questions about the machine itself and my process of building it. So I wanted to make another video to hopefully answer some of your questions, and I also wanted to talk a little bit about what I'd do differently if I ever built another machine. If you haven't seen that video yet, I recommend watching it first. So let's jump right into the questions. By far, the most asked question was, how much did it cost to build the machine? It's been quite a while since I bought most of the parts for the machine, and I didn't save all the receipts, so I can't really give an exact number. Now I'd roughly estimate, based on what I can remember, that for the machine itself, including all the electronic and mechanical components, I think I spent about $1,000. Now I did get some really good deals on a few things, particularly the aluminum plates and extrusions. The 3 8 or 10 millimeter plate, for example, I found at a local industrial surplus store. Something like that would have cost a lot to ship due to the size and weight, but I only paid 40 bucks for it and it was enough to make all of the components of that thickness. I also got a really great deal on the 6060 profile extrusion on eBay, but that is another item that would be good to buy locally if you can. Another way I saved was by purchasing a refurbished Makita router, which worked just fine. I only paid $75 for that. All in all, my advice is to look for local deals on the raw materials if you can, and get the rest on eBay. Beyond that, most of the rest of my components came from Amazon, with only a few specialized things being sourced from other sites. If you can't find metal locally, there is an online supplier called Axometry, which offers custom size aluminum stock for sale, but it is more expensive. That's where I got the half inch thick aluminum stock for the x-axis backplate as well as the gantry crossbar. In addition to these costs, I had to buy the bits and work holding clamps. Also, I built an enclosure, so there were a few more expenses besides what I mentioned earlier. I think the second most asked question was, will you share the plans for the machine? I will make the Fusion 360 file available, but I want to be very clear about what I'm sharing. This should not just be followed as though it's some kind of perfect design that's completely ready to go. All dimensions should be verified before you cut anything. There are actually many things I would change, which I'll get to later. Also, I may have made slight alterations to components to make everything fit together in the actual build that aren't reflected here. So if you choose to download this, use it more for inspiration than some kind of instruction manual. I'm not responsible for any issues you may face if you just copy the design without understanding it. Also, please note that some components are not in this file, like bolts and nuts, since I just didn't feel like adding over a hundred of them to the design when their placement should be obvious given the hole placements. There's other things missing too, such as the cable chains and other minor add-on components. This file does contain other people's models I got via the website called GrabCAD, so I'll try to add info crediting all of them. Check the description of this video to find the link to download this file. Another question I got a lot was, where did you get the 3D models for the carvings? All of the carvings featured in the video are original designs by me made with ZBrush and Blender. ZBrush is an incredibly powerful digital sculpting tool that lets you create highly detailed models with a variety of brushes and other tools. It is a paid program, but offers a monthly subscription if you don't want to pay up front. Fair warning though, it does have a steep learning curve. Blender, on the other hand, is a completely free and open source modeling tool that is actually really awesome and has a huge community behind it. So I highly recommend it for anyone who wants to learn 3D modeling. The actual toolpaths needed for the machine to do these carvings were generated in Fusion 360 after I imported the models there. I'm going to be making a video about the whole process of turning a 3D model into a wood carving, so stay tuned for that. A few people also asked, can you explain or go into more detail about the wiring setup for the electronics? I'm no electronics engineer, so this may not be the best way to wire everything. But here's a quick diagram of how I set everything up. This is a diagram that I put together to hopefully help some of the people that had questions about the wiring. So the image that you're looking at right now is a schematic for all of the wiring, not including the wires that go from the drivers to the motors. Those are pretty self-explanatory. Basically, the ground and voltage that comes from the power supply goes into those connectors, and then the A+, plus, A-, minus, B+, plus, and B-, minus, those are the four wires that go to each motor. And the rest of this basically describes how the Arduino connects to the pulse, direction, enable, and the switches, which are connected through the limit switch isolator board. So if you want, now would be a good time to pause the video, maybe take a screenshot. I'll also put a link in the description to this image if you want to reference it later. The opto isolator board is optional, and I'm not even sure it does much, because I still had issues with electromagnetic interference and had to switch over to shielded cables. If you want to know more about how to set up the wiring properly for an Arduino-based setup, 
head over to the GRBL site where they have extensive documentation on this subject. I also figured that I should talk about the bits I use with this machine. I've collected several bits since I built it, but the ones that I think are essential for the kind of carvings I like to do are the following. A facing bit for leveling the spoil board. I use this one inch bit with three teeth on it. This could also be used for flattening off large pieces of stock. A quarter inch two flute spiral upcut bit. I use this for cutting profiles around objects or for making flat pockets in material. You could also use this to carve text into a sign or something like that. A quarter inch two flute ball nose bit. This is great for roughing out the first pass on my 3D carvings. A one millimeter tapered ball nose bit. This is what I use for the final detail pass on the carvings. A quarter inch single flute end mill. I use this for cutting aluminum since it allows me to run the machine at a slower rate relative to the router RPM and offers better chip evacuation. These factors reduce the chance of it overheating while doing a job. From what I understand, this is also a great option for cutting clear acrylic and other plastics. I do have some other bits that I just don't use as much, but it really all just depends on what you want to do with the machine. And now I'd like to talk about what I'd do differently if I built another machine. First of all, I have to make something clear. No machine is perfect, and there's always going to be trade-offs between size, power, rigidity, speed, and other factors. For example, given any specific component, Rigidity is inversely proportional to machine size. So if you have a linear rail 20 millimeters thick, it will have a larger possible deflection if it's six feet long than if it were three feet long due to the constant properties of the material. This is true for many components on the machine. So bigger isn't always better. There's also the issue of cost. So it all really comes down to how much you want to spend on the machine and what type of things you want to make with it. With this design, I was just trying to cover all my bases as well as I could and also keep it semi-portable, or at least movable. So let's assume I built another similar sized machine with the same purpose. First of all, I think it might be better to have the x-axis be longer than the y-axis. Basically, what I'm saying is, I'd swap the lengths of the x and y-axis linear rails and screws. It's a bit awkward that the machine is longer than it is wide because I'm always looking at it from the side the way it's currently set up. Also, by making the x-axis the long axis, you can reduce the total mass that is moving if the machine is cutting back and forth on, say, a large parallel pass. To go along with the first change, I'd switch to using dual motors on the y-axis. I'd mount these at each end of the gantry and link their drivers together so that they would turn at the same time. Most larger machines use this setup, and for good reason. With my current design, theoretically there could be some slight twists to the y-axis, since I'm using a centered y-axis ball screw that transfers motion to the gantry via a cross bar underneath the bed of the machine. It was also hard to get those components aligned properly when I built the machine. I could also get rid of the legs that hold up the machine by doing this since I could mount the screws to the side. This would reduce the vertical height as well as the center of gravity. The next important change would be to use a variable frequency drive and water-cooled spindle instead of a wood router. These are more powerful, can be controlled by the microcontroller, and are quieter as well. Another thing I'd change is what type of linear rail I would use. Here's what I used in the machine I built and here's what I would use next time. The round rails I used allow for rotation of the sliding blocks, which isn't needed and lends itself to a reduction in rigidity. The flat type don't rotate and can also be lower profile, which is a nice bonus. On the subject of linear rails, I would probably change the pre-built Z-axis I used out for a custom design one with supported rails. Using the one I bought saved me a lot of work, but since the rails are floating, it's not as stiff as it could be. I'd also look into using a different control board instead of an Arduino. Arduinos just aren't that powerful, and the firmware that runs on it, GRBL, just doesn't have as many features as some other options. Mach 3 or Mach 4 systems are the industry standard from what I understand, and are more robust and just better overall. The downside to this is that the software that they use is not free, so that's another expense. The next upgrade would be to use closed loop steppers or servo motors instead of the open loop type ones that I used. Closed loop systems provide feedback on the physical position of the shaft after every step, so losing steps just isn't really an issue. This leads to improved precision. These can get pretty expensive, however. I'd also like to find a way to cover up the rails of the machine somehow because they do have a way of getting pretty dirty. I've seen some people add accordion-like plastic covers to these and I really think that's a great idea. And finally, the most important, but also the easiest upgrade, now that I have a functional CNC router, machine cut parts. I had a lot of trouble getting everything to fit together right on my build since so many things were essentially done with simple tools. By using the machine I built, I could make parts that have precise dimensions and fit together with super tight tolerances. This would not only make everything easier, but also improve the rigidity of the machine. As you probably noticed, most of these upgrades or design alterations have something in common. They increase the cost. You're probably going to have to double or even triple the budget to accommodate all of these changes. I was actually aware that there were better options than what I used when I was building the machine, 
But as I said before, my budget was a big factor. I think that all of these improvements would be worthwhile and would be significant upgrades to the design. It's really all just a question of how much effort you want to put into it and how much you want to spend. And I'm sure that I will eventually build another machine and probably incorporate most of these. But for right now, I am happy with what I have. I hope you found this video informative. If you have any questions or suggestions for me, feel free to leave those in the comments below. If you want to see more content from me, please consider subscribing. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.